So, welcome this evening. I'm delighted to see you. Vic Gregg sends his apologies. He has got the bug, and at 93, we need actually to wrap him up with a bit in cotton wool and get him back later on to tell that quite fantastic story that he has. Um, so, I'm the stand-in this evening, and bringing forward the talk about Mike Sinclair, who is known as the Red Fox of Colditz. There is downstairs, uh, if you want to look on your way out, uh, a little case which um, has a few memorabilia, memorabilia in it about Mike, um, something that we hope we're going to Im improve on. And if any of you happen to be over in what was the former East Germany and visit Colditz, there is quite a good little display in the castle itself um, about everything to do with Colditz and Mike Sinclair in particular. Um, I hope you'll enjoy the story. It's a pretty amazing one, in, in my view. This is Mike Sinclair, who was commissioned into the KRRC and uh, was the most successful escaper who spent more time free in occupied Europe during the Second World War than any other person. But he never made a home run. And he is, in fact, the only person who was shot and killed escaping from Colditz. But even that incident, as you will see, was bad luck. He was dogged by an awful lot of bad luck. He was born in 1918. He was educated at Winchester College and then at, uh, at Trinity College, Cambridge, where he read history and modern languages. He's red-headed, stocky, fluent German speaker, very determined, meticulous in his planning, and a very strong Christian. He had two brothers, Christopher, who was in the Rifle Brigade, who fought throughout the Second World War, and John, who was in the Scots Guards, who was sadly killed at Anzio in 1944, shortly before um, Mike himself was killed uh, at Colditz. He saw it always as his duty to escape and I think his capture at Calais was probably uh, the lowest point of his life in many ways. Uh, he was really expecting to fight a war and do his duty. When the war started, he was actually training reservists, and he made a great effort to get back to the battalion and join it. And he succeeded, and he became a scout platoon commander in A Company of 2KRRC. Seats at the back. I think you've got a couple straight there. Oh, one more. And... Okay, come on in. In 1940, you'll remember that the Germans were breaking through in France, and at the time, 30 Infantry Brigade, which was uh, a hastily formed unit that had been going to Normandy to join the 1st Armoured Division, was made to deploy into Calais. It had a couple of Green Jacket Battalion, regular Green Jacket Battalions in it, two KRRC and one RB, and they were the only motorised units that there were in the British Army available at the time. Along with them went the Queen Victoria's Rifles. And so you had a very green jacket heavy brigade in Calais. Um, the Germans had broken through, if I can get the technology to work. There we go. The Germans you know had broken through and it looked as though they were going to completely cut off the BEF who were heading for Dunkirk. And it was decided that they should deploy some forces to Calais to try to delay the German advance. It was a chaotic move across the Channel. It was actually done under peacetime regulations. Guns were packed separate to ammunition. The barrels were packed with grease. The petrol for the vehicles was placed on the decks. And you can imagine what a risk that was be in, it would be in the face of air attacks. When they arrived in Calais, there was a marked lack of stevedores to help them unload, and a great deal of uh, lethargy amongst the ones that did turn up. Most of the KRRC vehicles were unloaded, but 
Intermittent shelling as the Germans closed in in Calais meant that the boats packed up and left and the poor old rifle brigade uh, were only able to unload half their vehicles before the boats departed. The battle for Calais was very short. It's not part of our story really this evening, though it starts the story, lasting about five days from the 22nd to the 26th of, uh, of May. It was subjected to heavy air raids and shelling. Supplies ran low and defenders were eventually told that there would be no attempt at, at uh, evacuation. So you can imagine what it must have been like if you were in Calais. If you think about being at Calais, going to the ferry terminal, you can actually see the White Cliffs of Dover. And if you're there watching the White Cliffs of Dover or seeing the White Cliffs of Dover, knowing that you are not going to be evacuated no matter what comes, it must have been a very, very difficult time. Eventually, the defenders were pinned down on that last bit of ground, and that is uh, Terence Cuneo's picture of the last uh, battles at Calais. And that's where the ferry terminal is now. So if you're parking your car there uh, on the way back from France, just have a little think that you're actually standing where the Germans finally overran the defenders of Calais. Everybody was either killed or captured, <coughs> bar a handful. The adjutant of the, of the KRC got away, but no more than half a dozen people actually got away. Mike Sinclair, for his part, received a mention in dispatches for his part in the battle. He was, in fact, recommended for a, um, a military cross, but it was not awarded to him, and he got a mention in dispatches. Everybody was rounded up, and they were marched off into captivity. The first march was Calais to Bastogne, about 180 miles they marched for two weeks, doing 16 to 20 miles a day, with very limited food and water, and it was very, very hot. And you can imagine after a battle, uh, you're going to be exhausted, you're going to be demoralised. It must have been a very, very trying experience. But from Bastogne, they were then taken by train to Trier. They were loaded into cattle wagons that were labelled... <laughs> as there. Uh, Forty men or eight horses. But they were actually packed in, sixty, to a wagon. Standing room only, nobody had room to sit down. And they had one <coughs> latrine uh, for, the, for the use of the, uh, of the inmates. They had two small ventilation holes at the top of the wagon. And an awful lot of them, I'm afraid, were suffering from diarrhoea, so it must have been pretty unspeakable. When you... Th question yourself as to why people didn't get away early. Everybody is taught in escape and evasion that they should in fact escape at the earliest opportunity. But when you're going through conditions like that, when you've fought a battle and then you've had to do the march to, to Bastogne, it's not surprising that uh, an awful lot of them made absolutely no attempt to do anything other than to survive. The destination was actually a place called Laufen. It's right down, almost on the Austrian border. During the journey there, when they had a, a, a chance, they tried to get the floor up from the railway wagons that they were in, but nobody actually succeeded. And they eventually arrived in Laufen, after several days, and it was the old Bishop's Palace that had been hastily redesignated off leg 7C. It was a place that was absolutely hated by everybody who was in there. The accommodation was over 120 to a room. They slept on, on three tiered bunks and the food was limited. Daily, that's what they got. 7 o'clock, a mug of coffee. 11 o'clock, a mug of soup, with, as uh, Grizz Davis Scurfield describes, one or two half rotten potatoes floating in it. Then they got uh, the same as at 11 o'clock in the evening. A small piece of cheese on a Sunday, a loaf of bread to last the week, and about twice a week a small piece of sausage and a small pat of margarine. 
three 60th officers formed up as a team. And that team was actually to stay together through quite a lot of the story. This is Ronnie Littledale. He actually made a home run eventually from Colditz um, and was killed in Normandy, commanding 2KRRC. Uh, and he was a great friend of Mike's. He was also a Wickhamist. And he, his death was probably one of the things that sparked Mike Sinclair's final attempt at escape. The other person who formed the, the trio, Chris Davis Schofield. Um, some of you may have, uh, may have known him, may have met him. He was wounded at, uh, at Calais, um, but by this time had recovered and had made his way to join the rest of the 60th, who had been captured. At Laufen, they started a tunnel. Those three started a tunnel in the music room leading off the main reception hall. Uh, the digging was done in teams of three. One of the team was on watch, and the other two were actually digging underground. In the 60th team, Gris was the one who kept watch. He was uh, quite adept at playing the piano, and so he'd keep watch. And as soon as anything happened, he pulled the plug on the wire out of the wall so that the tunnel was plunged into darkness. He would then cover the entrance to the tunnel, sit down and start either playing chords or strumming on the, on the piano. Um, the Germans came in totally unexpectedly one day, and he, he did exactly that. He plunged the, the tunnel into darkness, put the cover back on it, started playing, but the Germans went absolutely straight to the entrance of the tunnel. It looked as though they had been tipped off. They uncovered the tunnel, and they pulled out Ronnie Littledale. Sorry, I got that wrong. They pulled out Mike Sinclair. Forgive me. Pulled out Mike Sinclair. Ronnie Littledale stayed hidden, which when you listen to the story, later on you'll see is uh, prophetic, because the same sort of thing happens later in the story. But um, Ronnie stayed hidden. Mike was then taken off and put into arrest. And he and Grizz, as the man who was playing the piano, were sentenced to 42 days of what they called string arrest, which meant that they had to sleep on bare boards, that they had um, bread and water for three days out of four, and on the fourth day they were given a bowl of soup, and they were allowed no books, no writing material, no cigarettes. Every other day, though, they did get a walk. Unfortunately, although they weren't allowed contact with people, many of their friends would walk around the area that they were to, to be exercised in and hide little goodies underneath the snow, which they managed to find from time to time. Before they actually finished their period of arrest, they got sent on to a place that was called Posen in Poland. It was a long train journey. The prisoners were locked into carriages, and once again, they tried, those three tried to get out by making a hole in the floor of the carriage. But uh, again, no, no success. Posen was actually an old, an old Napoleonic fort, which had been turned into a prison camp that this time was called Stalag 21D, and it was a reprisal camp. A report had been made by the Red Cross that German prisoners in Canada uh, were being mistreated. Uh, in fact, it, it was a spurious report. But the Germans took reprisals and decided that this was where they were going to lock up people in retaliation. They were very unpleasant facilities. They were substandard, very poor exercise facilities. Officers were 30 to a room with only one latrine bucket, so they were locked in at night, one bucket between 30, emptied in the morning, and they lived underground. <laughs> We look in this picture, strangely enough, you can actually, if you had good eyes, that is Grizz Davis Scurfield, and that's Mike Sinclair arriving in Posen. It really was an unpleasant place. Fleas were a particular problem, and prisoners used to compete to see who could amass the most dead fleas in an evening. 
um, at bedtime. They caught them from their own uh, blankets and clothing using a piece of wet soap. And the record for an evening's uh, hunting was, anybody like to hazard a guess? 123. 150, not bad. <laughs> not bad. 150. Um, Mike and uh, Grizz Dave Schofield were summoned after three weeks there to complete their arrest. And they were locked in a turret together. Uh, they weren't allowed any exercise, but they, um, but they did have some uh, washing water every day, which was a bit of a treat, uh, although they had to sleep on bare boards. Little Dale, by this time, had joined them, and between the three of them, they devised an escape plan in May of 1942. Now, at Posen, the rubbish was collected each day by orderlies in hand-held carts and taken out of the camp and dumped into a, a really rather unpleasant rubbish pit. It used to be carried over the moat. Uh, one of the guards would then be alerted and uh, would open the gate the orderlies would carry the stuff out and dump it into this, into this hole in the ground. They reckoned that it would be possible to get out that way, probably one at a time. And it was Mike Sinclair who actually worked out the plan and also managed to secure a contact with a Polish electrician through a young boy who was working in the camp alongside one of the Germans. The plans were made... They went for a slightly larger handcart so that they would be able to conceal themselves properly. It had to be big enough to carry Mike Sinclair or carry an individual, but also small enough so that people could actually um, manoeuvre it and carry it, and it looked like the original. They prepared clothing using blankets and scraps. They obtained German money. They took essentials with them, like razors and compasses, and they made their bid for freedom on the 28th of May in 1941. Uh, Mike was the first one to go. At 11 o'clock, as the others watched, the orderly took the cart and got it out and emptied it into the pit. They, they had been very careful in the observations that they made of the Germans, and the person or the sentry who was on duty was actually renowned for being quite lazy. And instead of going and supervising the orderly, he just watched from a distance. Once the rubbish had been dumped into the pit with Mike in the sack inside it, the orderlies came back and the gate was locked. And at a set signal from within the camp itself, because everybody was watching, and Mike Sinclair could see from the pit where, they, where the, uh, the observers were, at a set signal, he got out of the, the sack of rubbish dusted himself down, put on a cap, was wearing, in fact, some khaki trousers that he dyed blue and a short mac, um, and the cap was obviously homemade, and off he went, and he walked off into the town. He had got an address in the town from the Polish contact that he had made, and the arrangement was that he would meet the other two when they got out at four o'clock in the afternoon in the town. Unfortunately, just after he had got out, the camp commandant ordered a parade of the orderlies, and so everything had to be brought forward. Um, that meant that uh, Grizz Davis Scurfield and Ronnie Littledale had to get out in a hurry. They did, one after the other, but they had some time to kill when they were actually in the town. So they separated and wandered around the town. The arrangement had been that Grizz would arrive at four o'clock and the signal, uh, Grizz or, or a Polish officer would, uh, would arrive and the signal for them to make contact with him would be for the chap to take off his hat and scratch his head. Well, Grizz and Ronnie had separated. They came back together again. Ronnie actually saw this figure coming towards him across the road and got in a bit of a panic and shot off, trying to get away, only to be pursued because it was Grizz. And Grizz eventually got up to him and said, what the hell are you doing? And Ronnie Littleday said, I'm terribly sorry, I didn't recognise you, because he'd shaved his moustache off. <laughs> there was nearly a disaster there. In fact, uh, Grizz caught up with him and, said, and greeted him, um, 
to be greeted with, oh, it's you, is it? And then Grit said, well, who the hell did you think it was? <laughs> they eventually met up with a pole after an awful, awful lot of uh, head scratching because the chap didn't turn up until about half past four, quarter to five. And there'd been an awful lot of people they'd met and taken their caps off and scratched their heads out. But fortunately, uh, they made contact and they were taken off into a block of flats where they had a very excellent tea with a very pleasant young lady. They were moved several times within, uh, within Posen itself. Uh, and eventually, they met up with Mike Sinclair in a very large flat. And the Poles provided clothes, identity papers and uh, the means to change their appearance. They actually uh, got hold of of, uh, Grizz and they bleached his hair and his eyebrows. Uh, They darkened Mike Sinclair's ginger hair and then gave Ronnie Littledale, who actually happened to be a company commander, they made his hair grey. So uh, they had a little bit of a disguise. They were then taken by car and they were driven... Sorry, go back one... They were driven um, to Warsaw. So they went from Posen all the way to Warsaw. Driven in a car, and the man driving it was half German. And they had been instructed that under no circumstances should they speak to him at all. Uh, Particularly the two, Littledale and Davis Schofield, because they didn't speak fluent German at all. So Mike Sinclair did a little bit of talking and made the excuse that the other two had been suffering in the, after the Hamburg raid from uh, post-traumatic, what we call post-traumatic stress these days. But um, they were really, their nerves had gone. They reached uh, Lutz, where they stayed for about ten days before they were then moved by cart up to what was called the, uh, the controlled area uh, between the German fully occupied area and the Russian fully occupied area. The idea was that they'd get themselves across the border and into Russia. Unfortunately, which seems to happen regularly through this story, just as they were set to go, the Germans launched Operation Barbarossa. And suddenly, that frontier that they were hoping to cross disappeared. And so they were stuck. They had a debate about what what they should do um, and decided that actually they'd go back to Warsaw. They had to walk and they walked for about four or five days at 40 to 55 kilometres a day through some really very unpleasant uh, countryside. And poor old Sinclair with his red hair seemed to attract more mozzies than anybody else and got extremely badly bitten, and was getting very tired. Um, But they eventually reached Warsaw, and uh, they took a horse-drawn cab into the city. They went to an RV that they'd had from before, and they were met, and they then spent until August in Warsaw itself. They were very well looked after, and Sinclair, as usual, was making plans for what he was going to do next, and what the next move should be towards freedom. The plan was that they should travel down to uh, the frontier with with Turkey, go down to Bulgaria. Um, They actually did that. Not a great deal is known about the journey uh, because uh, Ronnie Littledale was killed and Mike Sinclair was killed. And they were the two that were travelling. They left Chris Davis Scurfield back behind in Warsaw. Uh, They got all the way down to Bulgaria and virtually over the the Turkish border when they were betrayed. Nobody's quite certain how, but they were betrayed and they were handed over to the Germans and they were then taken back, right the way back up, to Prague. They were taken by train. As they got into Prague and they were disembarking from the train... Ronnie Littledale and Mike both ran off. They managed to get away. And they hid underneath the train. The Germans came along looking for them. There was a huge, great spout of of steam from the locomotive. And Ronnie Littledale was hidden and Mike was caught. 
think back to what happened with the tunnel in Lofen. Poor chap. Um, caught again, and Ronnie Littledale got away. Mike had actually sprained his ankle, otherwise he might have run. Um, but he was caught, and he was taken off to Kolditz. That's Kolditz Castle today. And that was where he was to spend the next couple of years of his life. Littledale, in the meantime, um, was unfortunately rounded up in, uh, in Prague and was quite badly treated. It was a roundup following the assassination of Heydrich when many people were, were rounded up and taken off. But he was pretty badly treated, but then he was sent off to Kolditz as well. Now, there's some confusion over the next episode in Mike Sinclair's escaping story. Um, he suffered from sinusitis, and he was taken to Leipzig um, to, so, to undergo some treatment. Did a recce, taken there a second time for treatment to the hospital, climbed out of the loo window, and made his way to Cologne. In Cologne... <coughs> He was rounded up when they were looking for RAF pilots who had, been, who had bailed out of aircraft that had just made a, a mass raid on Cologne. So unfortunately he was, uh, he was rounded up and he was returned to Kolditz. In October 1942, Ronnie Littledale got out of Kolditz and made a home run. And so Sinclair joined up with a chap called Rupert Barry to make his next escape. And it was an escape from within the castle using the stairwell, the light stairwell. He and uh, Sinclair and, and Barry spent a lot of time looking in this sort of area here and concentrating on the stairwell that came down here into this light well here. It came down into the German quarters. It was like a hoist, like a shaft. This sort of thing you get in a hotel where they <coughs> winch the food up and down um, and the trolleys. And it actually came down into the German kitchen. They were wrecking this. They didn't know the French were wrecking it at the same time. And the two parties bumped into one another as they were examining the, the shaft. And there was a certain discussion about who had priority to go down because the escape committees uh, although the, each nation had its own escape committee uh, there was a certain amount of competition between people to get out it was eventually decided that one Englishman and one Frenchman should uh, be allowed to, to give it a go uh, Mike Sinclair was chosen and a French officer called uh, Charles Klein Sinclair was disguised as a German officer uniform made all the, uh, the various documents made as well. And Klein was disguised as a French prisoner of war who was working for the German commando. They sawed through the bars that protected the hoist, would you believe using a razor blade, a notched razor blade. They very slowly and very carefully over a long period of time sawed through. It was a good way of doing it because it made a very, very thin cut which could easily be hidden with just a little bit of bread chewed up and pushed into the cut and, and uh, messed over. At the appointed time, they were ready to go. They opened the bars, shot down on a rope down the light well and disgorged into the German kitchen, much to the surprise of one of the cooks in there. Uh, who looked at them but didn't do anything about it. And they then, bold as brass, went out from the German kitchen, down some stairs, saluting somebody who was coming up uh, as, uh, as they went down. They walked out into the German courtyard, up here, through the gate, and then off down the road and away. And they had got out. Once they'd gone out into the fields, they stopped, um, stripped off the uniforms they had on, and put on the civilian clothes that they, were, that they were carrying, separated, and went their own separate ways. Mike Sinclair got as far as Tuttlingen. 
just on the Swiss border. When he was there, he must have been quite tired, probably quite lonely. He made a mistake in that instead of going underneath a bridge, he went across the bridge and he was picked up. Um, he shouldn't have done that. It was something that all the, all the POWs talked about. Don't go over bridges when you're close to a, to a frontier. Try and avoid them and go somehow around them or underneath them. But he went over it, and unfortunately he was picked up and he was brought back to Colditz. He didn't give up, though. And in September 1943, he attempted his most audacious escape yet, and the one that's probably... Uh, the most famous of the, of the various escapes. There was a German guard commander in Kolditz who was called Feldwebel Rothenberger. He had a huge blonde ginger moustache and he was nicknamed Franz Joseph for fairly obvious reasons by the Kolditz inmates. Sinclair devised a plan to disguise himself as Franz Joseph and to take two other prisoners with him dressed as German sentries um, relieve them and then open the way for 30 or so people to escape from Colditz. He planned it meticulously. He studied this guy's speech, studied his mannerisms, uh, they made the, the uniform for him, they made the moustache for him, and he was virtually indistinguishable in the dark from Franz Joseph. All the escape material was assembled. Again, the paper, money, the maps, um, everything was put together. And on the appointed night, amidst great, great excitement, once Franz Joseph had posted sentries round here and come back <coughs> to the German quarters and the, in here, he'd gone past the guard and came back to the German quarters here. But once you'd gone round there, they came out, Mike Sinclair and the two others dressed as German sentries, came out of the sick bay onto the terrace here and began to walk round. These sentries with machine guns were not out at night. But he got up to here and he relieved the sentry. He said, there's, uh, there's been an air, air raid, uh, your time on duty is being curtailed uh, back to the guardroom, we're replacing him. And the chap went off. And he put a, put a prisoner there. There was another sentry just here. And he did exactly the same with him. And he posted the second sentry. There was one left on a catwalk which looked across here. And Mike Sinclair climbed up onto the catwalk and went up to the sentry, uh, who unfortunately was known by the prisoners as the ivory-headed goon because he was in, the, in the, uh, the prisoner's opinion. And this chap, in true German style, you know, befal is befal, I have my orders, um, he refused to go. It may be, it may be that in going across the catwalk here, um, Mike Sinclair forgot to look down each side, which was apparently something that uh, Franz Joseph always did. But... Whatever the reason, whether it was that, whether there was something wrong with his disguise, whether he hadn't got the right password, nobody knows. But by the time the argument was well underway, with Mike Sinclair screaming in fluent German and cursing this man and telling him to get back, otherwise he'd be in trouble, these two chaps have been relieved to come back round here and got into the guardroom, opened the door and... There's the guard commander, and so panic breaks out. <coughs> Franz Joseph collects some, um, some sentries, and they double round up to here. Mike Sinclair has now come down off the, off the, the, uh, the catwalk, and there is a blazing row with Mike Sinclair and Feldfeld Rothenberger, both arguing as to who was the genuine one. <laughs> who the hell are you? <laughs> An absolute blazing row going on. One of the German sentries, um, one of the Germans with Franz Joseph, pulled out his pistol. Sinclair pulled out his pistol, imitation one. Um, they had a row, and the German 
got so excited that he negligently, probably, loosed off his pistol. I mean, we all know what it's like with pistols, don't we? <laughs> they go off when you don't want them to. But it hit Mike Sinclair. Um, it didn't actually kill him. It ricocheted off his ribs and exited underneath his shoulder blade. Uh, but the escape was over. The escape attempt was over. But just imagine how close that actually came to success and what a fantastic escape it would have been. Because all this was being watched by about 30 prisoners in the, in the sick bay here and up here as well. And if it had been successful, at least 30 would have got out in a mass escape. Uh, probably probably um, Sinclair and the other two could have got away if they'd gone by themselves. But in trying to open the way for 30 people, they actually sacrificed themselves. But a very, very small margin uh, it was that uh, prevented them escaping. I think it's worth pausing for a moment just to reflect on the amazing skills that these prisoners of war actually had. When you think about them making passes, making keys, they could get into any room in Colditz making keys. Tom, uh, Tom Hamilton Bailey, I think quite a few of you probably know Tom, um, who was a, a green jacket. His father was in Colditz and he was an absolute consummate uh, burglar and key maker. I don't think it's rubbed off on Tom. But, uh, but they did make an amazing array of uniform accoutrements, making buttons out of gramoph cutting out bits out of gramophone records, making cap badges out of, uh, out of tins. They made weapons. They Even if you remember the Colditz story, they made a glider. It never got launched, but it was ready to go. Um, and it was uh, Tony Rolt who was instrumental in that. Visitors had to be very wary. Briefcases could be lifted while people were distracted, the contents taken out, copied, photographed, notes made of it, and returned within a matter of minutes uh, without the, the person who owned them actually realising it at all. Um, bribery? Bribery happened quite often. One, one chap said to one of the sentries, Do you know, I, I haven't had a fresh egg since I've been here in Colditz. The guard, come on, the guard thought, oh, Terribly, sorry, bought him an egg. Well, that was it. He was then caught because the prisoner said, well, thank you very much indeed. But um, Now, could you get me another couple of things or I'll have to tell the commandant about this. Uh, and that's the way that they worked. And one rather sort of unpleasant, um, but worth mentioning, because I, I think it's quite entertaining in a way. Um, if you're at all fastidious or, or sensitive, then, then block your ears. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's the, the topic of something they called arse creepers, uh, which were cigar. Um, you know, cigars come in those metal tubes. They used to be kept, and they used to be used to conceal money, compasses, maps, any contraband that could go in there. Um, they were then sealed up and inserted in the rectum, and that was how you, that was how you walked around um, carrying your hidden contraband. Um, that was fine until you went to the loo. Then, of course, you had to retrieve it and replace it. Strangely enough, the French in Colditz um, were remarkably fastidious, and they refused to go through that process. They used to tie a little bit of very thin thread around where the top screwed on, and so they could then remove it if they needed to before they actually went to the loo. Um, and unfortunately backfired on them, though, because there was one very astute German. <laughs> You're ahead of me. <laughs> a very astute German who was doing a body search, and he noticed that several of these Frenchmen had actually got threads um, hanging from where the sun don't shine. Um, and he went along pulling them out, which set the French escaping, uh, uh, escaping effort back by, by several weeks. Uh, but there we are. <laughs> Um, Mike Sinclair's next attempt he didn't give up, he was out of hospital within a couple of days and his next escape was with this chap a fellow called Jack Best um, he was one of the ghosts in Colditz have you heard, you know the story of the ghosts? maybe you don't um, when a couple of prisoners escaped 
Jack Best and one other person went into hiding in the castle, and the Germans surmised or thought that four had escaped. In fact, only two had. He and one other person became a ghost. They stayed hidden in the castle. They were fed by people who collected food for them and passed it to them. They never went outside at all. They became very, very pale-skinned, um, but they were invaluable because if an escape happened, they could be dragged out, and when roll call came, there were a couple of people to fill in the slots, so the numbers were right, and for a few days, nobody would know that anybody had got away. Uh, but uh, Jack Best had been a, uh, he'd been a ghost for a year, and his turn had come to have a go at a home run. Uh, Mike Sinclair had noticed that the lights, when darkness came down, the lights on the terrace and down here uh, did not actually get switched on until 60 seconds after really it had got dark enough to be able to get away. Um, and he reckoned that there was a chance of getting out in that 60 seconds from the sick bay across the terrace and down into, into the garden and away. He had timed it um, and you can see it again here. Um, the idea was that you came out of one of these windows here, down onto the terrace, went across the terrace, used another route to go down into the garden area here and away. Uh, it's all a bit overgrown because this is a, a modern day photograph. And the, the actual guard, German guard room was just in here. So you're doing it right under the Germans' noses but in a gap um, of, uh, of darkness. Um, they looked at it, they worked it out, they made the ropes, they made all their escape equipment again, the disguises they were going to have, and they practised in one of the stairwells in here, um, using a board, they, both, they lay on the board, the board was then tipped, and they'd grab hold of a rope and slide down to the bottom. Um, Sinclair went out head first and uh, Best went out feet first when they actually came to do it. Different methods, of, different ways of doing it. Uh, but they practiced and practiced and eventually they reckoned that they had perfected the way to get out. On the 19th of January they decided to make the attempt. Sinclair was the first one out. He shot out the window, came out the window, across the terrace threw the end of the rope over, because it was a very long rope, down to here, and was over the terrace, over the balustrade, and away. Very closely followed by Jack Best, a matter of seconds after him. Inadvertently, one of them, nobody knows which, pressed an alarm bell that was on the balustrade as they went over it, which rang in the guardroom. Uh, they knew it was there. How they managed to press it, nobody really knows. But Best had just got over, and they'd got down here. And the signal for this rope to be pulled back into the, into the, uh, the castle was a tug on the rope. Well, he just got down there, he tugged, the guardroom door opened, and a German sentry came out. Fortunately, he was um, slightly short-sighted and wearing glasses, and he was going from the light and the warmth of the guardroom out into the darkness, and he didn't actually see anything. He stared hard at the castle because the tug had happened on the rope and the rope was going back up into the window right under this chap's nose. But he didn't see it. I think he, he probably heard something, but he didn't actually see it. Meantime, down here, Best is uh, crouching at the foot of the wall. Sinclair's gone on a little bit where there is a wire entanglement and he's using a pair of wire cutters that have been made by one of the prisoners to cut through the wire. I mean, just, just think a minute. Being a prisoner, making a pair of wire cutters, I mean, it staggers me how they, how they did it. But he was cutting the wire at regular intervals. And this chap, thought he, he thought he heard the rope go up here, and then he thought he heard a sound down the bottom, but shrugged and went back in, and they were away. They slid down a scree slope here, through a barbed wire entanglement, and got out into the countryside. Uh, Mike actually fell down about a 20-foot drop and stunned himself, but they managed to get up and, uh, and get going again. They got out into the country and they walked 
to a station. They had managed to acquire a timetable through bribery, and they arrived at the station, bang on the time that the train was due to leave. They hopped onto it, um, and then suddenly discovered that it was the wrong train. (laughs) And they were going the wrong way. So they went um, a few miles down the track, managed to get out, but it then took them three hours to walk back to where they should have been and where they started from. Um, They got another train, though, and managed to get themselves from here all the way to Reina with the border with Holland, um, where they were within sight, almost touch and smelling distance of the border into Holland and Freedom. But they were extremely tired. They'd been on, the, they'd been on the, the run for four days. They were tired. They were cold. They thought that they'd get some bread and soup and, having eaten it, go and have a kip in a cinema. Um, they got to the cinema. Unfortunately, there were some German soldiers outside having a blazing row with the cinema attendants uh, because they were trying to get in after the show had started. So they thought, well, we'd better not try and get into the cinema. And instead of getting to the cinema, they stopped in the street and they had a discussion um, about what they were going to do. Jack Best, of course, looked extremely suspicious. He had dark hair, but he was very, very pale from being a ghost. And the German uh, police uh, from the police station outside which they were standing came over to investigate and they were bubbled and they were caught back in to Colditz. Well, you'd think after all that that he might have given up, but Mike Sinclair didn't give up. And uh, it was now September, and he had just received news that Ronnie Littledale had been killed commanding 2KRC, and that his brother had been killed in Anzio. He went for a walk by himself in the exercise park, which was where they were allowed to exercise um, during, the, during the day. Um, some people think that it was a suicide attempt, but I don't think that would have been in Mike Sinclair's um, character. He will have looked at the possibilities, worked them all out, and decided he would give it a go. It might have been reckless, but it was not suicide. He was emulating an escape that a French officer called Lebrun had done before. Uh, Lebrun vaulted over the wire here and ran off into the woods and got away. He was in, in gym kit, he ran off, um, and he made a home run. Sinclair wanted to emulate that escape. He met Grizz Davis Scurfield just before he was leaving to go on the excise area and asked uh, Grizz if, um, if, or Grizz asked him if he wanted company, and he said, no, thanks very much, no, I'm, I'm going off, just leave me alone. He went, he climbed over the wire, and he set off running, and the sentries who saw him shouted at him to stop. Everybody knew him because of his red hair and because of his escape attempts. The German guards all actually had great respect for him, and they didn't want to shoot at him, but they did. And uh, fire was opened, and about here, a bullet hit his elbow and ricocheted into his heart and it killed him stone dead. And so he had finally made his home run that he'd been after for so so very many years. He's actually, he was buried at Colditz. Uh, But at the end of the war, his body was moved to Berlin, where he's in the Berlin Military War Cemetery. He was mentioned in dispatches for uh, for his record as a prisoner of war, and then later he was awarded a DSO. Now, DSO was never awarded posthumously, so they backdated it to the 24th of September 1944, um, the day before he was shot as he made his final escape attempt. Out of interest, um, how did I come to become absorbed by Mike Sinclair? Uh, I said that he was buried in Berlin. Well, when Penny and I got married, uh, Mrs. Sinclair had died, and each of the brothers had given her a regimental brooch. And Christopher, who was still alive, uh, said that he would like the 60th brooch to go to somebody who had recently got married with 60th connections. 
and uh, as myself and one other chap were the last two commissioned into the 60th, the bridge wonderfully came to us and I became interested in it. The signals officer in the battalion was Grizz Davis Gurfield's son. So that was one connection and interesting. Tom Hamilton Bailey was the battalion second in command and his father had been in Colditz with, uh, with Mike Sinclair. When I went to the staff college as the DS, living opposite me was the cousin of Jack Best. And so I made contact with Jack Best and got some information from him. I got a translate, or I got French, a French uh, version of the story of the escape with Charles Klein. Gave it to the French liaison officer. Uh, to ask him to translate it because my French was not that great. You might remember all this book. <laughs> and uh, the French liaison officer looked and he said, Ah, but I know this man. He was a boyfriend of my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and it went on, and uh, it went on from there. And then when I was in uh, in Dover, uh, the chap who was the second in command there, his father had been in Colditz uh, with with Mike Sinclair. His name was Story Pew, and he was a tremendous chap for making um, making uniforms and even made shoes and things. So there's quite a long, uh, quite a long story behind it. And I'd say downstairs there is a photograph of Mike and a few, a few bits of memorabilia, uh, and we're hoping that we will be able to enhance that with stories of other people who, who were in Colditz with him at the time. But there you have Mike Sinclair, the Red Fox of Colditz, the man who spent most time free without ever making a home run of any prisoner in the Second World War. Thank you. <clears throat> Got about ten minutes before I gave them the, uh, the time for, uh, for the booze and the, and the nibbles to come out. Questions? Rob? Yeah, um, coldest is such a, such a part of British wartime folklore. Yep. Everybody knows about coldest. <laughs> I went there just after the wall came down, probably rather like you, and before I went, I spoke to a German friend of mine who lived in the same village, who was a keen historian, and I said to Bertus, tomorrow, we're going to Colditz, and he said, what? <laughs> I said, Colditz Castle, the famous mm. World War II prisoner of war camp. Mm. Never heard of it. Mm. And, and the Germans know nothing of it. No, they don't, but they do have a museum in there. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> they've, they've got the museum in there, and... Uh, um, no, they don't. Um, but then we don't know very much about prisoners of war that were in this country, do we? Um, no. Think of a go to Sennybridge training area, go up on the range. All those range roads were built by Italian prisoners of war. When you go up on the, onto the range, you come to the ring road, and it's called Dixie's Corner. Why is it called Dixie's Corner? Because that's where they used to take the hot meals up in Dixie's for the Italian prisoners who were working on the roads. So there's lots of things within there. Yeah. Uh, the Germans seem to be remarkably tolerant of him in a way. After the first rather severe punishment for his first escape, yeah. he just kept returning into Colditz. I mean, did he get punishment there? And why wasn't he sent to a concentration camp? He was <coughs> becoming a nuisance. I don't know is the answer to that. But certainly he was when he was returned, he yeah. was punished. Oh. Um, but um, they did... The Germans did treat the prisoners in Colditz, who were all pretty special. You were only sent to Colditz if you were an inveterate escaper. Um, and there were also there the, the people called the Prominenti, who were the very um, important figures uh, who, were, who were prisoners. But yes, they, they, were, they were treated quite well. And I think he gained huge respect from, uh, from the German military for what he did. And the man who was running Colditz, um, Eggers. Uh, he's written some fascinating books as well. Um, uh, he was actually uh, a very, very correct individual. Uh, and um, I don't think, unless he had fallen, unless Sinclair had fallen into the hands of the Gestapo, um, then uh, I don't think there was any, any likelihood of him being sent. He was doing what was his duty. Unfortunately, the guards and the... And the uh, um, management, if you like, or the, the commanders at Colditz, respected that. Um, which was, I mean, yeah, praise the Lord, they did. Because if Fit, Fit Greg was here, I mean, you read the flyer there, he escaped quite a few times, um, and then was uh, was court-martialed for sabotaging of... Mind you, you did sabotage a soap factory, so there's probably some justification for it. 
Yes, yeah, so it was one of the yeah. yeah not, not so much a question than an observation. I've been to Colgate's fairly recently, and uh, if you go to the little museum there and look out, you can see the um, window from which Sinclair and Jack Best launched themselves. And um, number one, it's very high. Number two, it's totally sheer. So the bravery of these people launching themselves just mm -hmm. before dark down this sheer wall mm. onto a courtyard and then what are we going to do then oh I know let's launch ourselves again over a wall down into some uncertain mm. garden and then off we're going to go through Germany again very uncertain so the bravery of these people is mm. quite extraordinary um, yeah now the, so the, the tension um, in in the rooms where when people were observing what was going on and what you know stooging keeping an eye on people coming around to to, to uh, alert those who were escaping uh, the tension in those rooms must have been amazing but how different now i mean yeah look at um i mean even go to the korean war what happened to um, anthony farrah hockley when he escaped um that was pretty unpleasant you know waterboarded um and tortured what would happen to you if you were caught by the Taliban or the yeah. uh, ISIS now, well, you'd, you'd be lucky if you if you got away with your life. Um, I was hoping to get Anthony Lloyd to come and speak here. He was a, a journalist you may have read. He writes in the Times. He was a platoon commander in, in uh, 2RGJ. Um, and that story where he uh, was actually turned in by, his, um, by the man who was guiding him around in... Uh, in Aleppo, um, locked in the boot of a car, he escaped from it. And but when the guy caught up with him, he just shot him in the ankle, so he couldn't uh, escape again. Um, so I, I think it was strangely enough, it was almost a game, um, although a very very serious game. But it was it was a game. It wasn't um, it wasn't so fraught with the danger of being uh, being murdered by by somebody. Uh, as it may be as today. Yes. Uh, Do you know how many actually made a home run throughout the war from Colgate? Uh, I could look it up. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but um, there were some famous ones who did. Obviously, Pat Reed, um, Barda, Douglas Barda got away from there. Airy Neve. Airy Neve. Neve got away from there, yeah. Um, well, that's three off the top of our heads. I, I, it's probably running to about 15, I would have thought, and if you do all nationalities. Quite a few Frenchmen did, and quite a few Dutchmen did. Uh, they had an advantage, in a way, the Dutch, because uh, you know, they, were, they were not speaking English right from the start. They were fluent in a language which sounded fairly German, even if it wasn't. Any more? Yeah. You Def mentioned the escape equipment that they had. I, I find it quite amazing that someone can navigate himself across Europe with a map that's probably not much bigger than a handkerchief and a compass. Mm. I, I wouldn't want to go from here to Salisbury with that equipment. <laughs> probably more accurate than sat-nav sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they were... A lot of that stuff was sent out from England, wasn't it? I did receive stuff. Yes, I did, yeah. yeah. There was a whole department in England <clears throat> producing yeah. like chess sets and things mm. with a tiny amazing stuff yeah, I yeah. know MI9 did that kind of stuff but I thought that was more for Royal Air Force people and what about people who were already sure. prisoners were they able to get that equipment into the prisoner accounts yeah they did yeah they, they, they used to, to send there were um, instances of maps coming in and monopoly boards mm -hmm. you, know, you open the monopoly board and the maps Something inside it somebody, you yeah. look at it now and you think how the hell is that you know, mm. they're getting mm. like that big into that big. <laughs> mm. But the, the ingenuity of those who are inside and the, the amazing skills that uh, yes. people discovered they had, um, quite frightening really, the number of people who could, who could actually uh, produce a fraudulent pass or could forge various things. There must be a set of those skills in here somewhere. <laughs> Does anybody wish to own up to it? Kind of yeah. Yeah. Any more? Grand, well, thank you very much indeed um, for, uh, for coming along and listening. Next one, 14th of March, is um, the flyer is on your chair, as I said. Rupert Smith and uh, Martin White. I hope we will get Vic Gregg back. 
uh, if not in May, then uh, yeah, sometime very soon, round about then. And I hope we'll get Simon Fenwick, who was going to talk uh, and had to be cancelled last November, who was talking about the postal services, the Commissariat of Affections. So uh, keep your eyes on that. We'll probably put another programme out, and we look forward to seeing you again. Enjoy the drinks and noodles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.